just look at nuggets of truth in the Word of God, particularly on Tuesday evenings till we, uh, I want to get us to a series, but until we get there, turn with me tonight to 2 Samuel chapter number 9, and uh, for some there may be some familiarity to this, um, but as we did last week, hopefully what is familiar yet we'll be able to gain um, a, a greater understanding of God's work. Uh, I mentioned before the law of first mention and how when the Bible says something, um, it progresses through and gives us more <coughs> information. So when we look at what God says about a particular subject, we may look in the New Testament and see something, but it may have already started way back in the Old Testament and gave us uh, bits of information, but we progress and we get more information. And uh, what I'm going to look at tonight is the story of part of David's life. David is a type of Jesus Christ. Uh, we look and we see that the tabernacle is a type of Jesus Christ. Even the offerings of the tabernacle, even how that they are a type of our worship uh, in Jesus Christ. The tabernacle, the, the brazen altar, if you're not familiar with what the tabernacle is, it was the establishment of worship that God had given to the children of Israel when they were leaving Egypt. And, and so it was a, a, a dwelling place of God's presence that was among them and uh, there was sacrifice that was needed because that was the only thing that would uh, cover sin. Remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they left the Garden of Eden and when they left, they hid themselves from God and they clothed themselves with vegetation. And uh, but, but God says that vegetation doesn't do that there must be the shedding of blood. And so then we find that there are sacrifices. And so God lays out for Moses uh, those Levitical things where they are sacrificing and they are worshiping. And all that it gives us a type of Jesus Christ and how he is a fulfillment of the law. Moses is a type of the law, the Ten Commandments and the law. The law itself can never ever save us. So if we're given uh, a set of standards to live by, we'll fail those standards. And so there's no way to erase that failure. So the law doesn't do anything but show that we are failures within ourselves. But when God gives us his son, Jesus Christ, he gives us the ability to wash away everything that we failed in. But he also empowers us to be able to live by the standard by which he gave us. Praise God. And so when we look, once again, the tabernacle is a type of Jesus Christ. Plus we find that, that, that uh, 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 David's life is, 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 is a shadow or a type of Jesus Christ. And I want to look at that, particularly during a, a time in David's life where he's young. He's not the, the adulterous man with Bathsheba. He's not the man who, who has experienced his son rising up and rebelling against him and trying to take over the kingdom. He's not experienced the sinfulness of his children, the, the, the murder that happens in his own home. Uh, you know, David's not experiencing any of this. We find him more in his youth, and we find this man who has gone through some tough times and has been faithful to God. We'll talk a little bit about those tough times. Not in great detail, but enough to give you information about David's life. And so... In 2 Samuel 9, verse number 1 through 4, the Bible says, And David said, Is there any, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, uh, the I is pronounced more of an E. And when uh, they had called him unto David the king, uh, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, uh, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not uh, yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness of, of God unto him? And Ziba said unto uh, the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan, uh, 
uh, said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of my car, the son of Emil and Lodabar. Now, we've looked at some of this before in the past, but hopefully we can bring some new information to us. And uh, we find that, that David is in a good place in his life. He has subdued some enemies. Uh, he has conquered, and uh, he is uh, conquering property that really belonged to the king that was before him, Saul. A little bit of information about that if you're not familiar. Saul was the first king of Israel. God still had the prophet Samuel on the scene. God was not ready for a, a monarchy. God still wanted a theocracy, which was that God was in control and that God would be speaking through the prophet, particularly at this time, Samuel. If you were here on Mother's Day, you remember Sister Rachel talked about Hannah and how she longed for a child, how she comes to the, 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 the temple, and uh, uh, there Eli is. He's not like our Eli. He's a, a man who actually, uh, his heart is far from God. His two sons are, are really rebellious and is a, a really just a real mar to the things of God. Uh, but 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 God honors Eli. Eli says uh, that, that she'll have a child. She says she's going to loan him to the Lord. We don't know exactly the age, uh, uh, and so we do know that it was early on. She brings him to the house of God. Uh, Samuel's very sensitive to God. The Bible says that that there was no open vision. Things were spiritually dark. Uh, uh, folks were not uh, uh, inclining to talk to the Lord. But the Lord wakes Samuel one night and, and, and speaks his name. Samuel thinks it's Eli. And so he goes to Eli three times. It happens. Finally, Eli perceives that it's God who's speaking to him. And so God uses this great man, Samuel. And so uh, as the people want a king, Samuel still is the man. He still is the prophet. Saul was given to be king. And though he was head and shoulders above the rest, though he looked so very good to the eye, he was a man who did not uh, uh, keep himself in a relationship with God to lead God's people in a proper direction. And so we find that uh, Saul, King Saul has a son, his name is Jonathan, and uh, there is a, a real friendship that is built between Jonathan and David. They become uh, great friends. They, they are, uh, their friendship is one that you may look back at your life and think about someone you've been friends with, kind of like another sibling. If you would adopt them into your family, by kind of like friend that's family by choice. Uh, they, these two guys are, are just uh, uh, great friends, and they have each other's back throughout life. And we find that Jonathan certainly does that for David. And uh, so David makes a commitment that he's going to take care of, 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 of Jonathan and Saul as well. And so uh, we find that here it is that King Saul has died, and, and, and David is anointed to be king. He comes on the scene. Now, most of the time when there is a king that, that, that another king comes up on the scene, he's kind of like the lion who takes over in Africa. If he, if he uh, 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 takes over the space of a, another <coughs> male lion, he drives him out, that lion will actually take and will kill the, 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 the cubs of the lion that he's chased out. Because he doesn't want any of the blood of, of, of that lion to be in. And it will also cause that lioness to come into heat. And that lion will, will then conceive and bear cubs with, with the lion that he chased out, his lioness. And so it's kind of that same mentality even when it comes to the day and age in which they are living. If a new a king comes on the scene. He really, he, uh, uh, to prevent future threats, he gets rid of all the family, all the competition of the previous king. But David promised Saul and Jonathan that he would not do this. David wants to show God's kindness to anyone who is left at the house of Saul. So when we look at this story, it's a story of grace. It's a story of integrity. 
It's a story of keeping with your word. It's a story really of getting involved in the lives of others. And so <clears throat> in David's care from Mephibosheth, we find that it really is a picture of God's love and care for the sinner. And it's a beautiful picture. I've said a lot of information already this evening, and hopefully you're gaining and gleaning from that. But what I want to do, now that you have a basis of understanding what's happening, if you didn't, I want you to understand that the kindness that we're about to perceive of David to Saul, his son Jonathan, and to their descendants is a real picture of God's grace to us as sinners. We don't deserve the grace of God. We don't deserve favor. We don't deserve the love, the kindness uh, that is here, but God gives it to us. And so the word kindness means this. It means uh, loyal love, uh, loving kindness. It means grace. It means mercy. And so we find that David finds an old servant of Saul. His name is Z-I-B-A. And uh, as he finds him, <coughs> he informs, uh, 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 Ziba informs him that the king's uh, uh, son, Jonathan, has a son that is alive. His name is Mephibosheth. And he continues to say that he is lame on his feet. Uh, uh, and so... Uh, as we look at this, lameness in these days, it's not like today. There's not advocates. There's not education. Lameness is considered to be a shame, an embarrassment, a stigma. Uh, it, 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 it is reproachful. And so it's interesting that Mephibosheth, his name it means this. It means the speller of shame. The speller of shame. And so Mephibosheth's story, uh, he becomes a cripple. Remember, David is looking for some, some lineage. He's looking for someone in the line of Saul, someone in the line of Jonathan. He finds Mephibosheth, lay him on his feet, uh, a reproach in this day. How did he get there? Well, Mephibosheth was about five years of age. Uh, he became crippled in both of his feet. I'm giving you information from the Word of God. You can research it and uh, uh, for yourself. But when the news of Jonathan and Saul's death reaches uh, uh, the nurse who is taking care of Mephibosheth, she knows that the Philistines has killed Jonathan and Saul. She thinks in her mind, which is only natural, which is only right, that they're going to come after Mephibosheth as well. And they're going to take him and they're going to kill him. And so she is fleeing with the child. She's a good nurse. She has a desire to do what's right. Uh, but somewhere in the middle of this, her flight, she drops Mephibosheth. And, and, and being dropped, his legs are severely injured that he would always have a reminder of this dark day that's happened to him. Let's stop here for one minute. How many of us, don't raise your hand, how many of us can remember one tragic dark day maybe when something happened to us and it changes your life? But that's just an example of that. Tragedy in one day. His stand now becomes fall. His ability to be able to live a life at ease is gone. It's a struggle. One day changed it all. And so uh, we look at him and his mountaintops turn into desert valleys. And Saul's home, which was in Gibeah, means hill. So Mephibosheth lived in the hill. He was on top of things. But now he is moving to Lodabar, which is a low and a, 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 a very barren place. In fact, really, if we look at this story, 
And Brother John would give a name to the story where David is searching out to give grace to the, 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 the one that is left of the lineage of Saul and Jonathan. We would say that there is grace in barren places. Wow. Wow. Sink your teeth into that. Wrap your mind around that. How many of us have ever had barren places in our lives? But it is a reminder that there is grace in barren places. All of, uh, all of us through the chef's uh, security, uh, it becomes insecurity. All the comfort that he had in his life, it becomes pain. All of us can probably remember, and really if we want to be quite frank, let's talk about things spiritually, where maybe one day in our life, a decision, an act, one thing happens, and we are arrested by the guilt of sin and the overwhelmingness of knowing that we are a sinner and we need the grace of God. We're handicapped. We are, our, our, our comfort has gone away. Security has gone away. And, uh, uh, the Word of God says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Well, an act in a day can change our life. I'm kind of hearing and seeing, Brother Doug, you, you've seen the big uh, mill where my dad worked Growing, growing up, my dad worked in a paper mill, huge paper mill, West Baco, went to uh, New Page, and um, uh, uh, Verso was the name of it now. It doesn't mean anything to any of you all, but this paper mill that actually just uh, settled in Potomac, made up this little town, provided heat to all the houses in town, uh, 130 years, uh, a company from Miami's uh, Burg, Ohio, owned this paper mill, and guess what, they showed up a month ago, and they said, after 130 years, we're closing you down. Wow. It is the livelihood of almost 800 people, 800 families in our area back home. One day, talk about taking your feet out from under you. One of the young men that go to, goes to our youth camp the week before, he went on an interview, and he was hired, getting ready to start there. And the next day they announced, we're closing. You people that I went to high school with that has you know, 20, 30 years of service in there, we're closing. Just bought a house, we're closing. I say all this to say this, one day can change our lives. Change of job, change of relationship, health status, someone taking away from us. Uh, prematurely or without warning. Because we know this, James says this, whereas you know not what shall be tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and is vanished away. And so here it is that Mephibosheth has been living the last 18 years in Lodabar, barrenness, the desert, <coughs> um, the place where there's no pasture, there's no grazing. And so as he is there, for 13 years in the house of my car, uh, uh, who is the son of, of, of a meal. Now, when you read this, it's very interesting as we look at all of this, and it could possibly be, possibly, and I'm not saying definitely because not everybody agrees, but if you look at, at, at 1 Chronicles 3, 5, you'll find that the, 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 the Sheba's father was a brother to a man named Amil. Could it be that it is the same Emil that is the father of my car who is taking care of, of Mephibosheth, if you can align all that, who would later provide, provide for David in a very difficult time? Just interesting to think of God's alignment. And so here it is. The first four verses, uh, they're rich. They provide insights and lessons that, 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 we, what, that we, we can look at. First of all, David did not have to show kindness to Saul's family. He had a great relationship with Jonathan. They were like brothers. They had each other's backs. But it was not a great relationship with David and Saul. Saul hated David. David respected him, could have killed him. 
David lived like a fugitive because of Saul. He doesn't owe anything to Saul. But yet, he shows kindness. And he seeks out. He said, I made a promise. And I want to hold to that promise. Do you know there's someone else who made a promise? That doesn't owe anything to anyone. But he made a promise. A covenant with the Father. That he would come down to earth. And that he would be the sacrifice. Because there was no other sacrifice. So that there could be a covenant made between sinful man and God. Brother Doug, Brother Justin, nothing, nothing do I or you deserve for God's grace and mercy. But he comes seeking us to redeem us. Because one day in the Garden of Eden... Everything changed. A moment changes everything. They partook of the fruit. They were naked. They were clothed with the glory of God. They didn't know thorns. They didn't know pain. They didn't know uh, killing. They didn't know death. All they knew was life and joy and peace. But in a moment of disobedience, it all changed. Everything changed. One moment can change but yet God said, that moment came, but I am seeking. I am looking. Amen. David, he wanted to get involved with Mephibosheth because he had a burden to do so. Thank God. Amen. For the blessings of people who want to get involved. Can I shift gears here for one moment? We live in a society where people don't like to get too involved. Amen. Really? I want to be involved. I'm too busy. It's not that maybe they, 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 they're hard-hearted or they're mean or they're not concerned. That could be the case. But it could be, uh, 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 Brother Lynn, that people are just busy. I don't have time for that. I don't want to get involved. That's why we have locks in our doors. That's why we can't walk down the streets at night. That's, you know, we live in a world that is full of privacy. Let's respect the privacy. Because people don't want to get involved. But I think David is an example to us of how important it is that we get, when we get involved, we can make a difference in the life. Hallelujah. Amen. David had gained some things. He was in a position where God had anointed him to be. He had been forgotten. Uh, and he was the most unlikely, but God had a plan. Amen. Remember this. You may be the unlikely that God has saved. You may be the one who has felt forgotten. Amen. But when God gives you the position, amen, we have a responsibility to get involved in the lives of others. Amen. God doesn't want us to live a life of isolation. I really believe that's why he's created the church, so that we can have fellowship with one another. There's something about worshiping God when we come together and honoring God, but there's something about the body of believers that, 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 that we realize that God has put us here together as a family to get involved with one another. And I believe that true involvement involves fellowship. Amen. Something that we, we, we that's not done alone. Amen. We fellowship as believers. And so God, He wants us to get involved. And so uh, David says, I want to get involved with Meshachah. I want to know what's going on. I want to keep my promise. I want to make life different. May we have heart of David. That we want to make a difference in the lives of others. Romans says, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, 
rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, uh, continuing instant in prayer, uh, disturbing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, distributing, I'm sorry, to the necessity of saints. And once again, let me say that, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, be a, 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 a consider to men of low estate, be wise in your own conceits. Amen. There's lots of excuses that we can give for not helping one another. But I believe God's word commands us to help. Get involved. Love one another. Do what you can. When you see someone in a low place, know that God gives grace in barren places. God has certainly given grace to David, hasn't he? That shepherd boy, that red-haired, freckled-faced young man that's out playing the harp that his brothers forget about. That man who is on the run. That one who, who, who is forgotten about. But when God remembers him, he gives grace to others. God help us. God help us to search with grace. Amen. Remember this, and I'm not going to read all of these verses, but in 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 20 through 27, we, we look at the body that are me many members, yet they are one. We've got to take care of each other. I have head congestion. My hands are helping me take care of that head congestion. You know, we work together as a body. You stub your toe, what are you going to do? Your hand's going to reach down and take care of it. Your legs will bend. You might sit down on the floor. You know, your whole body responds to that. We are many members. And we need to respond to one another. Give grace in bare places. So David wants to show love and kindness to anyone of Saul's family. He wants to keep his word. And even though Mephibosheth is uh, crippled, David keeps his word. You know, it's, it's uh, David kept uh, his word that was easy to Jonathan. It was easy for David to love Jonathan. They were best buddies. Our girls are going to have this saying right now. I'm enjoying it. Sorry for my rabbit trail. But yesterday I had to walk in the house with Bella, and she said to me, she said, Daddy, Randy is my best buddy. And I said, oh, I said, is Daddy your best buddy? And she said, no, you're my daddy. Brandy's my best buddy forever. <laughs> it was easy. These two young men enjoyed the, the joy of life. They had each other's backs. It was easy to have a love for Jonathan, for David. Not so much easy for Saul. Yep, yep, you all have those folks in life. You, there's some folks that are pretty easy to love, and then there are others that, ah, oh, it's not so easy to love. They call me the cactus. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Kind of prickly, kind of stick you. You try to give love, and you get a kind of prickle back. Yeah, that's a good scenario. I'll buy that. Amen. <laughs> But, but it is a reminder that David is reaching out. It's a type, once again, of God. But God commended his love toward us. In the, while we were yet sinners. sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Sister Dot, when we were that cactus, God still loved. And so David's care from Mephibosheth, we begin to see God's care for us. Let's look at this in this light. Mephibosheth was crippled by the fall. Do you ever know any fall that crippled us? 
I already went through it. What? So you said it, the fall. The fall. The fall of man in the garden of Eden. Here it is that we were crippled. Wherefore, as by one man, the Bible says in Romans 5, 12, sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You may say, I'm not a sinner. We each were born into it. It's our nature. All because of sin and the fall of man, we've inherited it. And it leaves us crippled on our feet. It gives us problems just like Mephibosheth. Amen. It leads us away from the Lord. What does the Bible say? All, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one into his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. We all started doing our own thing. It led us away, this crippling, this fall. It led Mephibosheth away from the palace. For 18 years, he was hiding. He was hiding in barrenness. He was scared. He was afraid. Sin hides us away in a lot of fear. It keeps us from the pleasures that God has for us and the place that God has designed for us to live. But as David sought out Mephibosheth, so did God seek us out. So that we could put our feet, our crippled feet, under the king's table. That's powerful tonight. That's powerful. And so Mephibosheth, he lived in the house of Micar, which means soul. You may say, well, what does soul mean? Soul means this. We were sold out to the things of sin. Sin ruled us, it reigned us, it had bought us completely. Uh, for, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Sold under sin is, 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 is what the Word of God says in Romans 7, 14. We can't save ourselves because sin has power over us. We're sold out to sin. But someone came seeking us to purchase us from sin's hold. Praise God. Amen. Praise God while we were sold. And so Mephibosheth not only lived in the house of Micah, which means sold, sold out to sin, but Mephibosheth lived in Lodabar, which mean, means a, a, a barren places. Do you know without Jesus Christ, it is a barren place. There is no love. There is no joy. There is no peace. There is no security. There is no purpose really even for living. We're barren. What do people live for who don't know Jesus? They live for themselves. They live for the moment. There's nothing to look forward to. Do you know why we have so many addicts? Do you know why we have so many uh, drug, uh, our drug problem is running rampant? Uh, uh, it's just crazy. Kids living from high to high, becoming a way of life, because they're lost. They don't have Jesus. They're bound. But oh, when we're living in that place of barrenness, Jesus comes seeking. To take us to the hill. Where there's barrenness, God says, I give grace to barren places. You see, Mephibosheth was shown kindness for Saul, but probably more so for Jonathan's sake. Do you realize that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, Loved us as well, being part of the Godhead, and came to give himself for us. And because of his sake, God loves us. Titus says, but after that, the kindness and the love of God our Savior 
toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because of God's saving grace, we are accepted by the Lord. Amen. Just as David accepted Mephibosheth. Amen. The arrangement was, was this. Then David sent and fetched him out of the house of Michar, the son of Mil from Lodabar. And now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And, and, and David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. Here he is. We find that Mephibosheth, when he's brought to David, he falls on his face and, and, and worship to, uh, to, to David. He's grateful. There's so much that can be said there, but for the sake of time, I want to move on. And David said unto him, Fear not. And Pharaoh said, You don't need to fear. I'm not going to annihilate you. I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father, and thou shalt eat at the bread of my table. Wow. Wow. David treats him with loyalty. How does God treat us with loyalty? Though we've been the prodigal son in a faraway place living in the pig pen, God desires for us to come back, kill the fat calf, give him a ring. Put a robe on him. He treats us with loyalty. You see, there's some things that are said here that are important, and I'm going to close and give you an opportunity to talk. He says, fear not. He meets his need mentally. We need those needs met mentally. We do. I will show you kindness. He meets his needs emotionally. I will restore to you all your inheritance. He meets his needs physically. And he says, and you will fellowship with me. What does he say? Now I'm taking all three of them. That emotional, that uh, mental, and that physical. And I'm going to continue it forever. Meet your needs. Wow. In that moment when we meet God, mentally, emotionally, physically, He helps us. But He brings us into a relationship with Him. And He continues to do that perpetually. Always. Daily. He meets our needs. David said, I'm going to restore, I'm going to take care of you. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. God supplies our needs. Quickly, my food said, I'm like a dead dog. I have no value. Rock is thinking. Oh, but you have value to me. And David brings him in and shows him that. And not only does he show him that, but he gives him servants that will take care of him. Now you may say, Brother Seville, did God give us servants to take care of us? He sure did. He sure did. But I will not leave you comfortless. I will send you another comforter. He sends us the Holy Ghost. Is there a better servant than the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost? take care of us. He meets us at night. He meets us at work. He meets us on the road while we're driving. He meets us in health. He meets us in sickness. He meets us while we're happy. He meets us in the deepest of sorrow. He serves us. Talk about a God who takes care. And so when we read this, we're reading history from Israel. 
But God does it intentionally to give us this picture of who He is and what He does. Now stop it. What do you want?